Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, our session for this afternoon on the challenges on importing uh, into Canada. I'm Steve Tipman. I'm the executive director of TFO Canada, and it's really a pleasure to have uh, all of you uh, uh, with us today. You're in for um, a real treat because we have a couple of, shall we say, seasoned veterans of the import game, and uh, <laughs> they'll be able to talk to you about their history and perhaps uh, really pay close attention to uh, the challenges uh, and the opportunities that you've experienced over the last, uh, certainly the last two years uh, during COVID-19, uh, supply chain disruptions, et cetera. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, I work at TFO Canada and since our early days uh, in May 1980, uh, we've been an organization that's been dedicated to improving lives by creating sustainable trade partnerships for exporters from developing countries with Canadian and foreign buyers. TFO Canada facilitates access to the Canadian and international markets by sharing commercial expertise for the benefit of small exporters in developing countries. So as I mentioned, the theme for today is around challenges on importing into Canada. And there's no doubt that COVID-19 has presented many challenges on how buyers source products. From changes in consumer preferences, product shortages, supply chain disruptions, as well as transportation issues when importing into Canada, buyers have been able to overcome many difficulties and continue to do so. And so one question that we ask ourselves is how do successful importers do it? Another question that those that are involved in international trade has been, and they've been asking this over the last year, is what can we expect and anticipate when it comes to influences affecting supply, global supply chains in 2022. Interestingly enough, I, I, I was reading an article in The Economist, and they put it this way. They said, the era of predictable unpredictability is not going away. So that's a little bit of bad news there, guys. Um, <laughs> and of course, the arrival of the Omicron vi variant in late 2021 provided us with a reminder of the unpredictability of this pandemic. The emergence of new variants during 2022 could accentuate some of the current pressures. Other events, such as the war in Ukraine, is also having a dramatic impact. So logistics experts are also saying that despite some easing in recent months, international shipping costs are likely to remain high in 2022. Um, <clears throat> last point, just outside of global supply chain brought on by COVID-19, it is expected that freight and transportation and processes will continue to change during the year as more environmentally sustainable practices are adopted. These practices will affect everything from transport vehicles, such as switching to electric delivery vans, for example, uh, through to changes in the wider supply chain such as relocating distribution centers to minimize distances traveled. All of this to say that businesses need to be resilient and able to adapt to major disruptions in order to develop long-term strategies and solutions to these complex challenges. So as that is kind of a backdrop, I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist, uh, Claudia Herrera, uh, who's the Vice President of Procurement with Fennec Foods, Inc. And so Claudia has, o Claudio has over 30 years of experience in the frozen and fresh fruit and vegetables industry. He is a well-respected buying expert who has traveled the world visiting growers and processors in over 20 countries. He is the former director of procurement at Alaska Foods, Inc. and president of BV Fruits. Claudio and his family live here in Montreal, but enjoy spending as much time as possible in their chalet in the Laurentians. So maybe Claudio, you can give us a talk to us a little bit about uh, your your company, how you became a, a global player, and, and talk about some of the challenges that you faced over the last couple of years. So Fennec Fruit is a Montreal-based company, uh, sourcing we source globally and locally. Uh, we like <coughs> Tim mentioned to over 30 years of experience in the produce industry. We source from 15 different countries over five continents, and sometimes over 20 countries. 40 act we have 40 active processor and packers worldwide, six packaging suppliers, global and local network. We also harvest, our main goal is the harvest weights for no one, 
key facts. Crop commitments are best made three months prior to harvest. Diversification of supply is critical to reduce risk. Incremental quality requirements at the time to approve processors. The fresh market can impact the availability of frozen product. False demand can create unnecessary competition on the market, which raises your costs. Key issues, inflation and the added cost into the supply chain. Increased freight costs and port delays. Delay in obtaining packaging and materials worldwide. Climate change and the impact on crops. Our model focus fast and flexible. Supply relationships, core and vegetable products, organic and conventional. Long-standing key grower relationships is key. Global sourcing from certified facilities. Fennec operations <coughs> team members, 25 year plus industry knowledge. Speed to market, lean operations and key support at every stage. Market and innovation, packaging leadership and recycled bags. Customer relations, relationships, focus customer relationships in the food service, industrial and retail and the club retail channel. Flexibility and customization. That's basically what Fennec frozen foods and vegetables does it day in and day out over a year. Great, great, thanks Claudio. Um, so our next panelist is uh, Jerry O'Regan and he's the Vice President of Sales and Strategic Sourcing at Cedarome Canada Inc. And so from his humble beginnings in Ireland, Jerry began his career in the fruit industry at the age of 15. Since joining Cedarome in 1994, Jerry has expanded his knowledge of essential oils. 15 years in fruit markets and over 27 years in essential oils has given him highly developed knowledge of the products in this important industry. He has also had the opportunity to establish long-term mutually beneficial business partnerships that have helped Cedarome <clears throat> become the largest essential oil company in Canada. Cedarome is also Canada's leading producer of essential oils and is known as one of the world's top essential oil retailers. Jerry's passion for essential oils and raw materials combined with his in-depth knowledge of market trends and key players defines his role alongside their president, Pierre Trahan. Um, establishing long-term and mutually beneficial business relationships with suppliers and customers provides sustainable solutions for the sourcing of hard-to-find products, provides strategic assessments regarding the direction of the essential oils business. Jerry, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, Cedarome Canada. We're an essential oil company, as you said, um, and uh, here we are today, uh, coming out of COVID, hopefully. Um, our, my strategy changed probably around 2014, 2015, when we noticed uh, the emergence of the aromatherapy industry. Um, who were sourcing natural products um, at the same locations, uh, whether it be Morocco, Tunisia, Sri Lanka, Brazil, Argentina, as the big conglomerates. And um, of course, they could not be ignored by the conglomerates because um, they were willing uh, to take the pure natural product as is. Uh, this is important because um, from a sourcing standpoint, when you're trying to compete with these conglomerates to gain access to raw materials. Um, the, the question that I have or had was, would be, what do you need for this product? Not how much? And this is an important question because the conglomerates, um, you know, they go there, they buy the product or you know, make offers on the product and these uh, farmers, and you have to understand that these people, um, where they may seem sort of wealthy in their environment, are actually, to us, quite poor, or it just appears that way. And um, it's very difficult to walk onto a farm and make um, you know, a farmer an offer and then kind of just walk away. We did things a little differently. What we did was, we went, we identified key players, key producers, and we asked the question, you know, what do you need? How can we help you come to market, to our market? Do you need help with equipment? Okay, do you need some financial assistance? 
how can we help you? Okay. Um, after that, you know, we, we developed these producers and convinced them to adhere to all the standards required for our business in North America. Um, the aroma, just getting back to the aromatherapy industry, you know, you, you could not ignore them because you have companies like um, Young Living Essential Oils in Utah uh, with sales of $2 billion US. And that's only one of many companies like that. So the big F and F companies had to pay attention to these farmers now and give them the true value of their product. So we had been doing that and working with them, educating them, uh, supplying equipment, technology, and helping them. And for that reason, we at Cedarom, um, when it comes to the supply of product, are essential oils. Um, we really have very little problems in importing the products that we need. Okay? Now, the, the markets that we cover, of course, the flavor industry, the flavor industry, you know, beverage, industrial cleanings through some of our byproducts with citrus. And of course, markets have not behaved. Transportation is a, a disaster. We're bringing um, containers out of China, you know, that you know, used to cost you know, four and a half or five thousand dollars, and now we're getting billed with eighteen to twenty thousand dollars US. Okay, we need to pass that on, but we need to, um, you know, to pass it on immediately and let people know. And what we're doing is we're trying to educate our producers and growers in, you know, you know, we buy out of maybe 26, 27 countries. We ship to 48 countries. Okay? Um, and we're just trying to um, get our heads around what is actually going on. Okay? Uh, another part of our business here in Canada, the extraction of essential oils. Um, we're doing coniferous essential oils. Again, we're trying to you know, use the circular economy model where there's no waste in the products that we do. We produce you know, black spruce, we produce cedar leaf, fir needle, uh, fir balsam, these type of products. There is no waste with these products. They're a byproduct of the forestry industry. So when they're taking down the wood for the, forest, you know, for the, uh, for the building industry and other applications, we're taking the byproducts that leave the branch of the needles. We're distilling it, taking essential oils, making concretes and absolutes <coughs> for the fragrance industry. And then after all of those extractions are done, the byproduct is used as a biomass. So it goes back to making green energy. So that's basically what we do. Very interesting. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Claudio, you... Sorry, you, you, you didn't mention that I had ADHD, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but okay, you're... Because you're I, I have another... I was going to actually... Um, I had a whole thing written, right? But uh, <laughs> forget about it. I'm off the cuff. Yeah, he's off the cuff. But that's okay. You can refer to that a little bit later if you need to. Um, I can't even read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Claudio, you, you know, you've been obviously in the business for a very long time. Can you talk to us a little bit about what has changed? What are some of the challenges you've had over the last two years and a bit? And, you know, when you think about COVID and production plants shutting down, supply chain disruptions, like what, what have you as a business, what have you had to do to adapt to, you know, continue to bring in product and, and sell to your, ultimately to your customers? Like what are some of the, the big things, the advice that you'd be giving to people? I think the first challenge we had is with, as a group <coughs> or as partnerships, we had to uh, inject more money into the company because we had to carry over an excess of inventory. Like Jerry's saying, out of China, usually into Vancouver would be a 14-day transit time. Now we're looking at 60, 65 days. Uh, we have climate changes all over the world. Uh, we have, at the field level, we were having issues with pickers because, you know, it's COVID for everybody. So instead of having, let's say, 1,000 pickers, you're down to 50 pickers or, let's say, 100. We had problems with packaging, packaging companies closing down. So that was another issue. We had to make sure the packaging gets in on time. Then they would load your containers and they would bring it to the port. And usually Vancouver was playing anywhere $3,000, $4,000 of freight. You would put the product on the containers, get it to the port. They were telling you $15,000. Then they tell you we need $18,000 because we can't, or else we don't deliver. So yeah, you're stuck. You put it on the, tri in the ship, it's coming. Then we had another, you had another two weeks where the containers were in Vancouver. 
hovering in the ocean and saying, well, the Canadian government would have no space to unload because the like, ships are coming in three times with more containers. There's three times more ships coming in. So I think the biggest challenge is, yeah, we have to, you know, you have to carry a, an inventory higher than what you're doing. Uh, the demand planning, we got to keep our demand planning and make sure that our movements, markets come, you know, the volumes that we have can cover your six months and beyond the six months. And basically just make sure that your inventories are moving at the right time and you're getting containers when they're, you know, ship lines or like, you know, Maersk or MSC, they're telling you that there's a, sh there's a boat leaving on the 28th of April. Make sure you're putting, well, you know, containers on that, on that boat that can cover your, your volumes for the customers and the retail or the processing plants or food service. So, so when you're saying you're carrying more inventory, so this means that you're ordering more than what your current needs are because, and you're wanting to probably keep it in a warehouse here in Canada and then you're able to just truck it to your customers? Exactly. Yeah. So before we, you know, you would overturn, you know, your warehouse would turn four or five times a year. This time it's not, it's turning less because now you're bringing in heavier product because yeah. you don't know when you're, the next ship is going to leave from destination. The so other instead of, let's say you're carrying a like thousand cases, it would probably carry four or five thousand cases to make sure that your customers don't run short right. on the shelves. And are you getting, as a result, are you getting more like a volume discount or is it still super high freight costs? The raw material, like Jerry said, the raw material we're negotiating at the farm level. So that, because we got partners on the farms or we're buying from the farms. We don't buy just the grade A's or grade B's, we buy the full farm. Yeah. And then we decide on which packaging it goes. But as long as you have the raw material, I mean, the raw material is one cost. What's really playing right now up or down is, is basically your freight. Okay. So, you know, and, and, you know, you're passing it on to the customers. And our philosophy is your raw material is here. If the cost goes <coughs> up, well, you're going to pay the cost going up. If it comes down, we're going to support you on the downwards. Right. And maybe one other uh, point. Some, some We've heard from other importers that uh, to try to help <coughs> with the, the, the container um, challenge and the availability of containers that they've moved from having 20-foot containers to now trying to fill 40-foot fill containers. Has that been your situation as well? Or? Yeah, no, we've always done 40-footers. Okay. So what I've done is we diversify our risks. Like I mentioned, we buy from many countries, and right now we're really coming down to buying in the <clears> U.S. <throat> but again, you know, I was, like I was mentioning when we were talking before, you know, the U.S., the North American, which is Canada, U.S., and Mexico, has I don't know, probably a population of 750,000, 750 million people. Canada only really only processes product or farms product east and west, and we only have three months of processing a year. There's 38 million people here, so there's not much food coming out of Canada, so that's a strain. The U.S. is basically the same. you got the west and east, which also they produce a lot. Right now, the, I believe the biggest country that's going to produce is Mexico, so there's a big strain on Mexico. But again, the fresh market always has the upper hand on the frozen market. Yeah. So the biggest challenge is, is how much is fresh, how much fresh market is pulling, are they consuming, <clears throat> what's the leftover tonnage. I mean, there's a lot of aspects going into it. And then, you know, you diversify your risks and there's different seasonality around the world that brings in the product. So we're making sure that our products are always coming in from different parts of the world and it's always as fresh as possible. Even though it's got a two year shelf life, yeah. you don't want to run a one year and risk of losing it. So, Jerry, I will get to you. I know you have ADHD, but I do have one more point with, with Claudio. Um, <clears throat> so you, you talked about Mexico and the challenges there. Does that mean then that potentially some of your strategies is to continue to look further south, Guatemala, Honduras, maybe in South America? Look, yeah. if you always want to look at your transit time. Right. Transit is, is, you know, that's, that's key right now to bring it in the product. But again, you know, last week there was an issue with Texas. You know, the, the U.S. border, you know, the U.S. border, the... Yeah. the the Texas government says we got to put on a strain on the Mexicans because there's you know illegal immigrants coming in. So yeah. Mexican wanted to get back at them. They did a strike, and here we are seven days with no product crossing in Mexico. So you know you're trying always to you always got to keep an eye open on where it's coming from and when it's coming and when it's arriving, and you always have to have like a plan B to make sure you're coming out of it on the upper hand. So on your mobile device, you must have feeds from all news sources from around like the world. Right now, it's, it's, I feel the buzzer being like every second. <laughs> Jerry, how about you? So you talked earlier that you kind of started already adapting and changing your business model in 2014. But what have the last two years uh, been meant for you in terms of some of these challenges that we've been talking about? Um, and how have you how have you just, made sure you continue? Just delays again. Um, when we work with producers, we try to buy as much <clears throat> of their products as we possibly can. Um, 
But unfortunately, I mean, there's so many challenges in the supply chain. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin. But um, just to give you an example, um, a simple thing like shipping a container of cold-pressed <coughs> lime oil for the beverage industry out of Mexico, you would think would be better to go by road, go to McAllen, Texas, and then ship it up. Now we're finding ourselves that we have to do it by sea. There's a couple of factors. Uh, of course, the uh, Mexican uh, cartel situation sometimes can be a problem uh, with hijacking in Mexico, which is, uh, can be a, a very um, serious problem for us, especially um, you know, for, um, you know, for planned production. Um, so we end up you know, adding time by shipping by sea and, 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 and things like this. The other thing, um, the products, one of our main products is orange oil coming out of Brazil, which is at um, an, an all-time high in price. And simply, very simply because of the lack of, of rain, the lack of water. Um, you know, they certainly get a lot of rain in, in Brazil, but it's all in one or two weeks, so it doesn't help the crops. And um, the, uh, the crop size is so vast that it's hard to irrigate. Um, even a small percentage of the entire crop. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with that. And, you know, we have contracts um, with them, and they just can't keep up. And global warming is happening. And, um, you know, Brazil is a, is, a, is a fabulous example. I think we should be looking at that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing delays from the transportation companies, of course, the uh, rising cost of transportation, and um, the unwillingness of the conglomerates to... Um, to, uh, to pay the, uh, the difference, which is a problem. Mm. So you mentioned the, the challenges in Brazil specifically. Does that mm -hmm. mean that you start looking at other sources, other countries to be sourcing the product? Well, we, we do source the products in, in, you know, in Mexico, in South Africa, in, in Spain, and whatsoever. But unfortunately, uh, Brazil <coughs> is by far right. the largest producer, by far. And, um, and unfortunately, to, to start off a, a new citrus grove in a different country, um, number one, it's very, very expensive. And number two, it takes years. Yeah. yeah. So we're trying to, you know, to, to work with the guys that we have right now, and it's, 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 it's a challenge. Mm. So how about all of you? Are there any questions, uh, members in the audience, that uh, you might have? Uh, we've got a combined uh, over 50 years of uh, importing uh, expertise in the, right here on stage. By the way, I started when I was 11. Yeah. And Jerry was very young. <laughs> Just want to get that out there. Any questions? When you make it importation from China, are you using New York part? Because it's half of the cost <coughs> if you bring it to Montreal. No, we don't find that. No, we don't. No. China is generally to Vancouver. Come China back to over. Vancouver. And the, uh, the time would also be a consideration, even if we were to do that. So the, the difference in transit time going to Vancouver versus New York, what, how many additional days would that be? Probably maybe six or eight days, I would say. Okay, so a full week for sure. Which is, yeah. You know, so, but then you gotta get into, New, then it gets off the port of New York, then you gotta cross the, you know, you got inbound letters, you need inbound letters, and it becomes, and Another challenge. More paperwork. Yeah. More people. And you know, for some of the uh, the big chains and the big uh, conglomerates, I don't want to be dropping <clears> any names, but you know, they have um, you know just in time, just in time. This has got to be here. They don't want to carry the inventory. You guys, you know, they don't want any of the risk. So you know, we're carrying a lot of the risk and carrying a lot of the inventory. But our philosophy also changed a little bit because, uh, you know, we say just in case. It's now to to buy. Now, just in case, because when these production lines stop for a day or a week or whatsoever, it's very, very expensive. So what we're saying to the big guys is you have to give us the extra 50 cents. And the 50 cents in your product, it's such a small amount, it's not going to make that big a difference. But we need to pass it on right away. And everybody, I mean, we all have to make our clients or customers understand that, like now. Because, you know, some of these products, especially the natural products that we're in, um, we're losing producers all over the world today. 
they just can't compete. Mm. And we're trying to help identify and help the good ones that we can work with. Yes? I was just wondering, because you have all these extra costs, right? And you have to transfer these costs to the consumer. How is the consumer taking this? Are they willing? I mean, what well, sales funds? No, if you, if you go to the supermarket today with $100 versus if you went to the supermarket two years ago with $100, your basket would be substantially smaller right now than what you could buy with $100. It's the reality. I mean, the price of gas, you know, for the, our extraction facility, some of them, they use gas. So, you know, you have an additional cost of 25% on production cost. I mean, this is huge. So it's basically like the gas station. You're going to the gas, you're filling your car and... We're passing it on, and some of them, they get, they take a pushback. Some of them don't, but overall, they're on my, on our situation. I think they're taking it pretty well. <clears throat> so we're, and again, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's always comes down to the raw material. The raw material is like, does it play up or down? Mother Nature plays with it. I mean, if Mother Nature takes out the blueberries, and today there's a freeze, let's say in Lac Saint Jean, he takes out 90% of the blueberries. I mean, it's out of my control. I mean, Mother Nature controls, and then. It's on price on demand, right? So depending on how much demand you have, that's what your cost can go up or down. The freight cost, is it going to play up or down? Yes, I don't think in the near future because right now there's maybe, I don't know many millions of containers in the wrong area in the world because of the pandemic. Until they reorganize all this, I don't know how long it's going to take. Maybe Jerry's saying the same thing, but again, do you see gas going down? I don't see it yet. I don't see the fuel going down unless no, Ukraine sure. or something, but... Like right now, you know, we're looking at Europe. So European countries are bringing in a lot of, the, we bring in a lot of vegetables from the European countries. Ukraine was a big producer. They're in war right now and, you know, Russia also. So we don't know what kind of volume I'm going to get out of that country. I don't know the volumes we're going to get. So it's, it, everything is up in the air. Uh, I, the only thing I can say is three years ago, I was able to do contracts, yearly contracts. Today, let's say China, they will not give you an yearly contract. It's by load. So the raw material stays and what plays is your fade up or down. So basically that's what we're, that's the challenges I'm having yep. on my end, <clears throat> on the fruits and vegetable end. Yes, sir. Um, I'm from the French embassy, so I'd love to hear your uh, uh, appreciation of CETA, for example, and also the challenges that you have uh, important from your So, you know, Europe is what I, and Jerry can also help on this, I'll give an example. In China, was with the biggest challenge because, we're you know, if you look at the Eastern market, is a very like competitive market in this type of market here. So, it's really cost driven. So, being cost driven, where your cost is really low, is sometimes it's China. So, that's where we need to go. As you know, on the fruits and vegetables side of the stuff. So basically, China, you'll you know, you don't get a. They'll tell you the containers leaving this week, or and then they'll tell you they'll call you and they'll say, well, there's no room on the ship, or the ship is overloaded. We'll go next week. So. Usually what I used to understand is all these ship lines used to give you a cost for, let's say, three months, three months up. Europe was the same way. Today, Europe is giving you one month. And after one month, what they're doing is, and, they're, and I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or maybe they can elaborate on this, is a container, they're telling container leaves on April 28, and you tell them, okay, I got products ready to ship on April 21. The ship line is not going to send somebody there till April 28. The price goes up and you got to pay the new price. So... This is what's happening out here. And Europe, there's not much containers coming out of there right now. Like for myself, Poland doesn't have much product because they had a bad crop last year. So we're moving away from there. Belgium is like also, you know, they, we do a lot of vegetables out of Belgium, but their price is high. So there's certain clients that we're selling it to. So there's not many containers coming out of that region. Serbia had a bad crop on raspberries. So that also kind of, so basically raspberries are not coming out of Chile or Mexico. So that's why we're always moving. The Europe... I don't know. I'm going to listen. I'm, I'm leaving today. I'm going to Portugal this week. I have a show in Portugal with European suppliers. And I don't know what to expect. To be honest with you, I don't know what, what's going to The war is driving a lot of stuff. I don't know what we're going to get. Jerry? The war in Ukraine, it's, uh, it's a disaster. Uh, some products that we have coming out of Ukraine, um, you know, for the uh, food industry, coriander, coriander seed oil, um, you know, there's just going to be no supply. Um, products coming out of Russia, um, fur needle oil, uh, Siberian, which would normally be um, competing with our fur needle oil Canadian. Um, there will be none of that product available for the rest of the year, and we don't know when we're going to get it. 
the effect that that has, of course, puts a lot of strain on our fur needle oil Canadian. And now we have to, you know, try to accumulate uh, workers and crews uh, to go and, um, and, and, and get some raw material, which is an absolute nightmare right now for us. So the other part of the gentleman's question was around the, the free trade agreement with the, the European Union. Have, have you seen any benefits to it? Have you taken advantage or have other issues just taken over that you can't even on really... My, on my part, the other issues have taken yeah. over. Yeah, the other, I mean, the, the, the other issues are, are they're so, <coughs> have such a, an immediate impact. Right. We don't even have time, right. you know, yeah. for this. Yeah. So. That's where but we you know when you look at you know when, when people see fruits in the in the store it, like it says oh it's beautiful it's nice, but to get that fruit there's so much it, it, we deep, it's not like a manufacturer you can't manufacture fruit, it all depends on mother nature so mother nature plays a big part on this, yeah. water mother nature how much water how much moist uh, you know and then you know if if it's too if it rains too much and then there's hot then there's humidity you know then you got ants you got well, your bugs they got to deal with it, and it's you just I, for me. What I've learned over the years, like Jerry, I've traveled, I travel over 120,000 miles a year to go different countries, different suppliers, but at the farm level, you want to be friends with the farmers, these are the guys that are, you know, bringing the food to the table, they're important more than, and, and the freight is, it's one of our, for me, it's one of my biggest costs, being hit by freight. So I've heard you both talk about the importance of relationships and, and building trust, and maybe, would you mind, Jerry, maybe elaborating more on that, because... It sounds like, although we've talked a lot about freight costs and other challenges, but fundamental to your business, it sounds like that relationship with your supplier is really key. And, and maybe call out, talk a little bit more about that. Yes, well, um, back in, like I said, in 2015 <clears throat> with the emergence of, um, of the aromatherapy industry, which was kind of new to us, really. I mean, it's always been there, but... <clears throat> When you see a, a company like um, Young Living in Utah, you know, bringing in sales of $2 billion. And like I said, that's one of a few companies. Um, and that raw material needs to be sourced. So when you're looking at a country like Morocco, who's producing uh, rosemary, um, wild, and it, it had been collected for decades, you know, for the uh, big FNF companies, um, and, you know, collected in, in the wild on, on public land brought to stations, weighed, and then the, the growers or the collectors, they get paid. And, um, and then they were given the price by the big the conglomerates. This is the price. Um, but with the emergence of uh, the aromatherapy industry, who needed the actual raw material to distill to make natural, unadulterated essential oils, now the FNF companies had a massive competitor at the farm level. So... I felt that, and I was, let's say, I was part of it. So what I did was I identified some key producers to produce essential oils for us for the future, knowing that it was no longer that the guys who supply Walmart and all these guys could go there and say, okay, this is the price. Now it was like, well, hold on. We have other options now. Okay, um, to give an example, um, a product like, uh, like myrtle oil was being imported to Europe or to, um, to, um, for the, you know, to Europe for the, F, for the fragrance industry. And um, it was being imported as a vegetable oil at a, I don't know, 15 or $20 a kilo value. In fact, when the aromatherapy, uh, you know, took off, they discovered that this oil was worth $150 a kilo. And that money was passed on to the producers. And we demonstrated that and showed them. And we gained a lot of credibility with them and trust. And we went back year after year okay, and brought them the real value. Now they're on par with the industry. So they're getting fair market value for their products. And I think that was very, very important for, for producers. Because we were losing producers. We didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And that's why. Mm. How about you, Claudio? You talked about, you know, it all starts with the farmer. Maybe elaborate more sure. on this, this relationship that you're, yeah, you're so building. It's a bit like Jerry's saying, right? Without a farmer, without any plants, you don't get any fruits. I mean, so it's how much money and how much, 
how much you bring back to them on, on the revenue, right? So they want to make sure that they, they get the maximum of their field or maximum of their product. <clears throat> so basically when, you know, somebody comes in and wants to buy, let's say, just grade A and the guy's left over with some grade Bs and some offcuts, yeah. what does he do with it? So it basically, you know, goes through the trash. So for him, it's like our philosophy is we go in and we buy the full, yeah. the full field, which, so, you know, the farmer likes that and that's what you need. I mean, without a farmer, I mean, you don't okay. have any product. I mean, there's okay. nothing... So they, they always want to see, like, in the past, like Jerry was mentioning also, some of these big chain stores would actually force them to take this extra cost of the freight. Why is the farmer taking the cost? Nobody understands why. I mean, the farmer needs to make money in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Today, the pesticides are up. I mean, the seeds that they're using, it's coming from oil, it's up. The gas, I mean, everything is up. So, yeah, so for me, it's very important that without a farmer, you don't have any fruits. Yep. So it's all about relationships. Yep. And that's probably the most biggest relationship you need to have is at that, is at that fruit level yeah. or at the plant level okay. in order to, for you to move forward. So to, um, to follow up on that, um, like I said, I, I started in the uh, fresh fruit business in, Ar in Ireland as, um, as a young boy. And, um, 11, right? You were 11. What's that? When you I was 11, 11, yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I was buying and selling, had my own company, started pre-packing fruit and vegetables and whatsoever. But anyways, when I came to Canada, I had experience, um, you know, purchasing fresh fruit. And the thing <coughs> about the fresh fruit is that this is where the farmer actually makes his money, by selling the fresh fruit to the trader. The other fruit, let's take in the case of orange, the blemished orange or the odd-sized orange, this is taken away for juicing, okay? So once they make the juice, the orange juice, the, there's another byproduct, the peel. In the peel, there's an essential oil. That's where companies like Citerome comes in. Because that peel, we extract the essential oil from the peel, and then we supply the beverage industry with the essences and oil of the fruit. So there's no waste. Even in the, the white part of the orange is a product called pectin can be used as a beer thickener whatsoever. So there's actually no waste. Okay, but my point is the farmer, he gets his full value for the fruit. And now we're maximizing the value of the byproducts. And that's where companies like Citerome uh, come in, in order to give, to use everything that they produce. That's why I said at the start, we try to use all their product. So it goes from start to finish. So there's no waste in Lemon, lime, grapefruit, orange, mandarin, tangerine, and so on, so on. That's great. Okay. That's but great. again, without yeah. a partnership, you don't have fruits. You don't have product. Yeah. Were there any other questions in the audience? We do have a few more minutes. Um, yes, sir. Uh, in your experience, is there any way to partner with anybody to lobby the transportation companies and the ports that hold your freight for ransom? Does it seem like that's the biggest I think that should be addressed by the government, uh, and good luck with that. Government. Um, it's 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 it, it's kind of like extortion. You know, we have um, I think we have thirteen containers in the port in, in Philadelphia. They know it's there, but they don't know when I'm going to get it. They can't tell me. Well, we know we have it, but we can't tell you when you're going to get it. I mean, this is ridiculous. But then you got to demerge. And Bill. then you have another little charge. Just a little fee on the side of the merge. And then there's other fees where waiting fees in the ocean, which is out of our control. It's all government control. It's like, the, it's like gas, right? Why is it at $2? We don't know. It's, is there any, what, can, what can we do? There's nothing you can do. It's, it's government issues. Yeah. Or let's say, though, I'm sure you have issues. We have issues the same way where the government goes, okay, we're picking this container to inspect it. And they might keep it there for, let's say, three weeks, four weeks, and every day is $300 at the merge. So basically over three weeks, times your 21 days, times $300, that's what you're paying. And it's either you pay or either you go back and get a container, they're not going to give you a container. They hold you hostage. Or they're going to make you load the container, and they're not going to give it to you because now you've got to pay them. So basically the government is, the government makes money. I mean, that's what it is. And in both of your cases then, um, one of the trends that we've heard 
in, <clears throat> is that towards uh, the the uh, the inco terms or X works? Is that sounds like that's the case for both of you that you're basically paying for the shipment from the time yeah. it leaves to you're taking Very care often, of all that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have to. Yeah, we have to. And, uh, Were there any other questions in the audience? Maybe I have one last question for for both of you. Um, so. You talked a lot about you know the relationships, and and how important it is to you know uh, you know without a farmer you don't have the fruit. What advice would you give to companies who want to become future suppliers to Cedarone, to Fennec? Like what are what advice would you give would you, would you give to them? Jerry, did you want to start? Well. Um... Depends on the the uh, the region, but um, you know, finding products um, that are are getting short, or looking at uh, new ways to produce, you know, products that are are slipping <coughs> away. Um, you know, the the food industry it needs more producers. We don't have enough food. People think, oh, no, there's, there's oversupply. There's oversupply. There's not. Okay, um, you know, looking at. Um, Different types of, of of food or segments, or whatsoever. Um, also, um, if I was talking to farmers, I would ask them to start looking now because it takes years to become organic certified, and I think that's a really important part. Having said that, um, I'm sure if you go to the supermarket and you have a look at the the tomato in the organic section versus the tomato in the conventional se section. The conventional is a much better looking, more attractive fruit to buy. Anybody agree with this? Put your hands up, please. There you go. Everybody buys with the, with the eyes. Okay, so, so this, is, this is a problem. The other problem that we're having at Cedarome is we're, our, our uh, quality assurance departments and our labs are exploding. We need more people. We, we can't get enough people to, uh, to work. Mm. Uh, the level of compliance required is off the charts. I mean, you know, asking, um, you know, pesticide analysis on, on products. I mean, if you buy a product from, even if it states that it's organic, from Egypt, for instance, okay, I mean, the, their water source is contaminated. So we're going to find pesticides at our labs in these products, any product. Um, and, and that's also an issue because we have to stand over the product. So if it goes on, on the shelves and there's um, you know, um, a banned pesticide appears at very small percentages, but if it's there, we're liable for this. So it's also very risky. So for somebody want, wanting to supply Citerome, I would, uh, I would advise them to go as much organic now and start like that because eventually the market is crying out for organic products. How about you, Claudio? What, would you, what advice would you give to future suppliers? Uh, be honest with organic products. Be extremely honest with organic products. Uh, follow the inspection, you know, follow the, the, the testing protocol, follow the, you know, the, there's so much, like, there's so much advice, you know, like, Jerry said it well, I mean, there's not much to say more, but, He's right where we're going. You know, it's a lot of organics coming out right now, and that's where the future is going to be. It's going to be on the organic products. But then I got to say to the consumers, uh, you know, you, we can't buy with the eye. We need to buy, you know, something might not look that nice, but it is organic. And then we got to be vulnerable which part of the world it's coming from. I mean, you know, the Canadian, again, when we're asking about it's Canadian government again, and somebody tells you organic, you know, the pesticides, there's maybe a thousand pesticides, but there's such a certain number that we're testing. We're not testing for all of them. So, yeah, because in, in order to test the pesticides, you need to have what's called a screen for That's each right. one. So you have to know what you're looking for. So we can test for, you know, plochlorides or whatsoever in, a, in a orange oil. Um, but there might be 15 other ones that we don't have the screens for. So we're educating ourselves and we're collaborating with <coughs> universities and labs all over the world every day. But still, it's it's a, it's a problem. Yeah, and just follow the uh, you know the social audits that also were getting planted on us. There's a lot of social audits going around, which you know the producers, they, you know the farmers or processing plants got to follow. And 
basically that's in the nutshell that's what we would ask people that they need to come with so honesty yeah. straightforward approach and you're 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 obviously organic if you're thinking organic stop thinking about it do it yeah because that is the future it is the future that's the future yeah absolute transparency in the sourcing transparency well gentlemen on behalf of everybody here, Jerry, Claudio, thank you so much thank for you. offering your insights. Thank you. Thank you guys.